Hi everyone, and welcome to lecture 5-1 on the thalamus. The thalamus is part of the diencephalon. The diencephalon is composed of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the subthalamus, which is a small portion of the basal ganglia, and the epithalamus. Now the thalamus is, uh, as you've probably heard, the relay station for the motor and sensory uh, processes of the brain. The hypothalamus, also part of the diencephalon, uh, mainly concerned with controlling autonomic functions and controlling the pituitary gland, which releases uh, hormones into the bloodstream. So uh, as far as the hypothalamus is concerned, if you think of the cortex as the location of the upper motor neurons then the uh, for the uh, corticospinal tract, then the hypothalamus is the location of the upper motor neurons for the visceromotor functions. Uh, so uh, moving on, the epithalamus, uh, it's involved in emotional regulation and um, some of the um, uh, motor output aspects of emotional regulation. It also contains the pituitary gland, which is responsible for producing uh, melatonin, uh, which helps us uh, you know, go to sleep and stay asleep, regulate our sleep cycles. Um, and that's all I'll say about the uh, epithalamus. The subthalamus, again, part of the basal ganglia, so it's uh, involved in controlling motor output. We'll talk about the basal ganglia uh, in a few lectures. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at the diencephalon and all of its surrounding structures. So first off, of course, the thalamus here outlined in this purple color. Uh, within the thalamus, it has uh, multiple different regions and functionalities and distinct nuclei, and that's what we're going to be talking about later on in this lecture. Below the thalamus, we'll find the hypothalamus with the mammillary bodies. Uh, so the mammillary bodies, again, are um, tightly associated with the hippocampus. Uh, in fact, the uh, fornix, which we'll see in a, minute, in a moment, uh, connects through a bilateral pathway uh, bidirectional pathway, the hippocampus with the mammillary bodies for encoding memory. Uh, the epithalamus has three different structures here. We have the habenula uh, for uh, you know, regulating emotion. Um, we also have the pineal gland uh, for endocrine functions and the posterior commissure, which connects the uh, two eye fields, the uh, superior colliculi, uh, together. Um, and um, also connects the, um, the uh, accessory oculomotor nucleus for um, light reflex and, and things like that. Uh, so uh, here we have some connections in the frontal region uh, of, the, of the diencephalon, the uh, septal frontal region, in fact. Uh, again, this connects with the hippocampus, so it has to do with memory, but it also outputs to the habenula. So it's uh, how memory can impact our emotional uh, state. Uh, and this connection is via the stria medullaris, this orange line traveling posteriorly from the septal uh, region to the habenula. Of course, we already mentioned the pituitary below the hypothalamus, connected to the hypothalamus via the infundibular stalk. Uh, so it's secreting hormones, uh, the primary uh, endocrine gland of the brain. We also have here the anterior commissure. I mentioned in a previous lecture how it connects the amygdalae together. And here, finally, we see the fornix. The fornix uh, originating mainly from the hippocampus, but again, this is also um, uh, bidirectional. But uh, primary fibers end up synapsing on the mammillary body, uh, from the hippocampus, but there are also connections directly to the thalamus and to the septal uh, regions of the brain. Uh, so we call these different connections post-commissural and pre-commissural fibers of the fornix based on uh, whether they're projecting anterior to the anterior commissure or whether they're projecting posterior to it. So uh, let's take a look at the thalamus and uh, some of the uh, connecting white matter tracts around the thalamus. Uh, I mentioned the internal capsule before, uh, so now we're going into a little bit more detail about the internal capsule. The internal capsule has a number of different regions to it. 
the anterior limb of the internal capsule uh, travels between the caudate nucleus and the putamen. The anterior limb of the internal capsule sends proprioceptive information to the frontal cortex um, to regulate uh, that proprioceptive uh, ability. So uh, we're getting information about how our body's oriented and we're consciously aware of that information and we can use that information that's in our cortex to adjust our posture as needed. It also contains uh, limbic projections up into the cingulate cortex and into the executive regions of the frontal cortex. <clears throat> so again, the uh, caudate and the uh, putamen separated by the internal capsule. Here, I'm using the term lin uh, lentiform nuclei. Lentiform means lens-shaped, shaped like a lens, like your eyeglasses lens. Uh, and that refers to the putamen and the globus pallidus collectively, or the globus pallidi collectively. Moving posteriorly, we get to the genu of the internal capsule is where the V shape start is bending. So that genu is located uh, right there um, at, at the bend of the genu. Uh, so that contains some of the descending uh, somatomotor fibers uh, to muscles of the face, head, and neck. Uh, so you can see here I put a little F at the genu to represent that somatotopic organization uh, at the genu. Uh, next, moving into the posterior limb, we can see an A, T, and L. That's for arm, trunk, and leg. Uh, so the posterior limb contains the somatosensory afferents in, in blue, more medially, and the uh, somatomotor uh, outputs more laterally. Uh, via the corticospinal tracts. So you'll find the corticospinal tracts and most of those afferent um, uh, uh, tracts um, in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. The posterior limb also separates the uh, lentiform nuclei from the thalamus. So if you see posterior limb, then you're bound to see a thalamus and, and the, uh, vice versa. If you see thalamus, then you're bound to see posterior limb at that point. Now, we've already encountered this track before in the lecture about the eye, the eye field, and how those are sent to the occipital cortex. The optic radiations are called the uh, retrolenticular uh, limb. Retrolenticular because they're behinding, uh, heading behind the uh, lentiform nuclei. We also have a sublenticular limb heading into the insular cortex. So this is sending auditory information as well as gustatory information to the primary auditory cortex. Um, and there's some of that gustatory stuff from the thalamus heading to the anterior insula as well. So this is a representation, a posterior lateral view of the thalamus. So you're behind uh, the person's head at like the three quarters view looking at the thalamus. Uh, the thalamus is a bilateral structure, so there would be two of these, one like this and one like that, uh, within the individual. And so that's orienting you. Anterior is front, posterior is behind. The anterior nucleus here is the most anterior. The pulvinar is the most posterior portion. And then we're looking at the lateral face of the thalamus in this picture. So the thalamus has many different regions to it. Its regions are separated by an internal medullary lamina. <clears throat> so this is a um, bundle of white matter tracts that's you know going into and out of the thalamus. And within this region, it also has, within these uh, white matter tracts, it also has uh, intralaminar nuclei, such as the centromedian nucleus. So we'll discuss the functions of these nuclei in a, in a little bit. We're just getting to the gross structure, and then we'll go deeper in. If we have an internal medullary lamina, then we have an external medullary lamina. And just like the internal has nuclei within it, the external also has nuclei within it, uh, particularly reticular nuclei. Reticular nuclei named after the uh, ascending reticular activating system of the brain stem, which um, we'll all see if we have time to talk about that. That's low yield, but it's a very interesting region that controls 
our wakefulness and arousal, arousal state, our awareness of stimuli and whatnot. So um, these nuclei, especially the reticular nuclei, responsible for regulating sleep. Uh, so sleep is an active process that your brain has to trigger in order for you to enter sleep. Uh, and so the reticular nuclei in the external medullary lamina uh, will then project throughout the rest of the thalamus and knock down these uh, incoming and outgoing signals in the thalamus so that you can go to sleep and not be disturbed by um, uh, you know, sensory input and so that your body won't output um, motor functions that are unnecessary when you sleep. Like if you're having a dream that you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, your legs won't, you know, run while you're in bed. Uh, so these regions separate uh, the different nuclear regions of the thalamus. So first we have the anterior cell mass, which contains the anterior nucleus. And this has limbic functions, decision-making functions, emotive functions, uh, we have the medial uh, cell mass, which contains the uh, dorsomedial nucleus, MD, also uh, me, uh, limbic functions. And we have the lateral cell mass here, which controls sensory and motor functions, uh, relaying that information to and from the cortex. Now we can see we have additional white matter tracks uh, from ascending and descending functions. And so let's talk about those for a minute. Uh, in the front, uh, something we're, we're not familiar with yet, it's coming from the basal ganglia, uh, but this is the thalamic fasciculus. When we get to discussing the uh, basal ganglia, keep this in mind because the output of the basal ganglia is to the VA of the thalamus. And so we're seeing that here, the basal ganglia is sending information to the VA of the thalamus. Uh, and that controls motor output from the VA of the thalamus. Now the cerebellum has tracts, the dentato uh, dentato rubrothalamic tract, or just dentatothalamic tract, sends information to the VL. So just like uh, motor information from the basal ganglia was going to the VA, we have proprioceptive uh, information from the cerebellum going to the VL. Now, something you have heard of before, the medial lemniscus from the spinothalamic, the anterior lateral tracts heading into the VPL of the thalamus. So this is where that ascending spinothalamic tract is sending its sensory information to the VPL of the thalamus. We have an analogous, so that's doing from the body, remember? And then the head and neck has a different sensory system. It has the trigeminal system, right, from the trigeminal ganglion. So that trigeminal information is coming into the VPM of the thalamus via the trigeminal lim lemniscus. Uh, and so that is, is how that information gets from the principal uh, sensory nucleus uh, of the trigeminal uh, nuclei to the thalamus and then to the cortex. Uh, another structure we know about, the optic tract. The optic tract synapses on the LGN of the thalamus. And analogous to that, the acoustic pathway from the inferior colliculi is heading to the MGN of the thalamus for auditory information. So all of these color codes represent are represented in these cortical, uh, this cortical drawing, same colors. So we'll see that the VPL of the thalamus is projecting to the medial and dorsal portions of the primary uh, sensory cortex of the precentral gyrus, or postcentral gyrus, I'm sorry, uh, postcentral gyrus. We'll see that the VPM doing uh, sense from the head and the face is going to the lateral portions of that postcentral uh, gyrus. Uh, so you can begin to see the concept of the somatotopy uh, that carries over from the thalamus to the cortex and from the cortex down to the thalamus in the case of the motor functions. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, having this in mind, it just gives you a little bit of extra information about what the different nuclei are doing and where they're traveling to. So now let's talk about the individual nuclei and see what they're up to.
So the, uh, this dotted line is, is attempting to show you approximately where this cross section on the right is coming from. So we've taken a cross section through the anterior and lateral cell masses uh, with the uh, internal medullary lamina or intramedullary lamina uh, represented here. So we've got a portion of the anterior nucleus represented here. Uh, so if you're looking at cross sections of the brain, this drawing represents what that cross section looks like. So the anterior nucleus is responsible for limbic functions related to attention and the focusing of your attention on specific sensory, uh, sensory uh, output, sensory um, input, sensory functions, sensory things. So uh, it's getting information from the hippocampus uh, and from the mammillary body, sending that to the anterior uh, nucleus. And its output is to the cingulate cortex, that uh, medial uh, gyrus just above the corpus callosum. Some interesting things that the cingulate cortex does is that the cingulate cortex is involved in error correction. So like when you do something wrong and you get that negative sense or, or you know that sense of a, you know shame or whatever you want to call it to whatever intensity, that's the cingulate uh, gyrus, cingulate cortex saying oh my gosh, whatever I just did, I shouldn't do again because it resulted in a negative consequence. So this region is telling you about negative consequences and it's um, trying to prevent you from doing those things again by remembering those events and then associating that negative feeling with those events so you don't do it again. Uh, so an interesting way to activate the cingulate cortex is called the uh, Stroop's task, where you write like a word in, like a, like a, like here, I'll do it on the, on the screen. So, um, I have written a color in a different color. Now say the name of the color I wrote it in, and you'd say blue, even though the word is written red. If you hesitated and said red, then that activated your uh, cingulate cortex. So that's, that's activating your cingulate cortex. That's what it feels like to have your cingulate cortex activated. Assuming you didn't like, you know, take a moment and ponder it and then do it correctly. If you just, you know, blurted it. So anyway, what happens when we damage the anterior nucleus? Uh, well, it makes it difficult for us to maintain focus, and because this is related to memory, it makes it difficult for us to remember uh, events. So, uh, anterograde amnesia uh, will result from damage to uh, this function, this uh, region. Now let's go a little bit farther back. We'll look at the dorsomedial nucleus, the MD nucleus. So it's receiving input from the amygdala, uh, and it outputs to the inferior portion of the frontal cortex, the orbitofrontal cortex. <clears throat> and so um, this is related to emotional regulation, our conscious regulation of emotions and, and, um, and our ability to, you know, um, not be controlled by the fear response or whatever um, emotions are being stimulated by the amygdala at the moment. Uh, so, damage to this region results in rage response. Uh, and a lobotomy uh, ends up relieving depression. Uh, so, a lobotomy targets uh, this region of the brain. You, you know, the lobotomy here in, in the medial portion, uh, you can, uh, you know, damage the MD and result in relief of depression, depending on, you know, well, it's not done anymore, really, so you don't, you don't want to do a lobotomy because uh, it sucks. Uh, but anyway, there's actually books out there you can read written by people who had lobotomies performed on them. So it doesn't always result in, you know, that waking coma state or the complete emotional flaccidity. Uh, so interesting, there are degrees of lobotomies. So anyway, I have here next to Rage Response uh, the name Charles Whitman because Charles Whitman uh, was the individual uh, in, that was responsible for the uh, Texas uh, sniper massacre uh, 
uh, in like the, when was it, like the 60s or 70s, uh, at University of Texas in Austin. Uh, Mr. Whitman climbed the Central Tower at University of Texas and uh, shot individual students on the campus. And I think the casualty rate was like 50 or 60 or so, and uh, many of them died. Um, but Charles Whitman, when the autopsy was performed, they found a tumor within uh, his uh, mediodorsal nucleus, within his thalamus, and it was uh, you know, believed to be a secretory tumor that stimulated this pathway, uh, making his emotions uh, control his actions uh, to an extent. And uh, Mr. Whitman wrote, uh, you know, had a journal, kept a journal, wrote about the voices urging him to do these things. And so uh, at any rate, that's, um, there are, you know, there are tumors that are stimulatory and tumors that are inhibitory and damaging. And, and so uh, at any rate, uh, that's an example of one of the potential um, consequences of such an event in, in this portion of the thalamus. So now let's move back to the uh, VA nucleus uh, uh, on the lateral portion of the thalamus. And here, VA nucleus is the target of the basal ganglia. Output from the basal ganglia uh, goes to the VA. The VA sends connections to the motor cortex, and that results in, um, you know, stimulation of a motor output, choosing of a specific motor uh, uh, event or function occurring. Uh, so we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about the basal ganglia. But damage to this region results in uh, decreased motor output, lack of tone, et cetera, et cetera. So VL, very similar, but VL is involved in the uh, cerebellar pathways. So uh, this is related to maintaining uh, coordination and, uh, and um, posture and that, that sort of stuff. So, but again, uh, just like the VL, it, it travels to the motor cortex uh, to then output through the corticospinal pathways. Now, the centromedian nucleus is, is interesting. It's one of these um, uh, uh, kind of arousal uh, state nuclei kind of related to the reticular system. And the reticular system of the brainstem actually inputs into the CM. Uh, in the intramedullary lamina. So the, re uh, the reticular system in the brain stem is a very diffuse uh, network of neurons that receive and output information about our wakefulness and arousal state uh, and control that state. There are ascending and descending reticular systems that can control how active we are. Um, so, um, and a lot of the reticular system is controlled by those gain-setting nuclei uh, and the gain-setting neurotransmitters like the serotonin and um, the acetylcholine and stuff like that. But at any rate, uh, this outputs to the striatum of the basal ganglia uh, and uh, controls motor control. So damage to this uh, region uh, especially bilateral damage or the tracks of it coming to or from it, will result in coma. Uh, so these individuals will be unable to move. That's how critical that nucleus is. Uh, moving on to the reticular nucleus and the extramedullary lamina. Uh, it is, again, responsible for this arousal state, attention, focusing of attention, uh, but also responsible for uh, sleep. So this... Uh, Functions on this inhibits the uh, thalamus during sleep. So all of those, uh, like I said before, we don't get those functions all mixed up. But it does not project directly to the cortex. It's just acting within the thalamus, controlling the, the relay station. So your cortex is still active during sleep. You're still imagining, you're still uh, see, you know, um, processing visual and auditory information uh, that you're, you're, that's being activated in your cortex, but your thalamus isn't relaying information up and it's not relaying motor output down. So when you're sleeping, it's just cortical activation from your, your natural brainwave patterns and the chaotic uh, 
processing that's going on in your brain that create the sleep function, the sleep imagery and, and experience. <clears throat> Next, uh, we already talked about these a little bit. The uh, VPL and VPM, the vost, uh, ventral posterior nuclei on the uh, ventral and posterior side of the thalamus. Uh, so these are somatosensory. And VPL comes from the body and VPM comes from the face. Um, so VPL, I think of the L as meaning limbs and that helps me remember that's from the body. Um, VPM, I don't know, um, your mug, maybe M is for your mug, your face, like a mug shot, whatever. Uh, whatever helps you remember it. So inputs from the sensory tracts. So VPL from the medial lemniscus. The VPM from the uh, trigeminal lemniscus, from the uh, trigeminal sensory nuclei. But this also does uh, uh, gustatory information, meaning taste. Uh, so taste information from NTS ends up in the, um, the thalamus here from the gustatory tracts from the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. And this information will output to the somatosensory cortex as well as the gustatory cortex, which is in the insula, the anterior portion of your insula. Uh, so that's where taste is processed. <clears throat> and then we've already talked about a lot of this, uh, especially the visual pathways, the LGN and the pulvinar getting that visual awareness information from the superior colliculus. So remember, talking about blind sight, uh, that, that function in cortical blindness where the occipital cortex can't process visual information, but the pulvinar uh, is able to still direct uh, individuals, their sense of, of awareness about where a light is in their visual field. And then the MGN for the auditory information. So. Uh, input from the inferior colliculus, output to the primary auditory cortex, which is in the posterior insula. Now, these next few slides uh, just provide some uh, kind of functional um, things for you to consider about these different pathways, like how the gustatory information from facial and glossopharyngeal goes to the ventroposterior nuclei. We've got somatosensory information from the face going to the VPM. We have the somatosensory from the body through the medial lemniscus to the VPL. And the, uh, also the anterior lateral, the pain temperature tracks going to the VPL. Uh, from the VPL, that goes to the postcentral gyrus. Uh, and the, of course, the taste is going to the insular cortex. Uh, so the VPM and VPL are somatotopically organized, and that somatotopic organization continues into the cortex, continues in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, as I already mentioned when we looked at the internal capsule slides. And so um, we've got that uh, somatotopic organization continuing into the somatosensory cortex, uh, as you can see there. So what are some clinical considerations related to the thalamus? So um, the uh, thalamic lesion is going to affect the contralateral side of the body, and it will likely involve multiple modalities at the same time because all of these tracts are converging into a fairly tight nucleus or a closely associated nuclei within the thalamus. They're not these separate tracts that receive separate blood supply. Now we've got one relay station that's closely associated. Uh, so uh, the blood supply of the thalamus uh, frequently includes or, or sometimes includes blood supply to the internal capsule. So if a stroke or an embolism uh, occurs, then uh, that can involve the internal capsule, which can involve both sensory and motor components simultaneously resulting in uh, hemiparesis if it's just on one side, of course. Uh, so also we have the concept of thalamic pain syndrome. So initially, a um, damage to a sensory component in the thalamus will result in analgesia, like a, a complete lack of pain sensation or, or uh, any type of somato uh, sensory input. Uh, but after uh, that period progresses, uh, 
and the degeneration uh, is, is reaching completion, then what happens is the, um, the cortex stops getting regulated and you end up with a kind of uh, paresthesia or hyperalgesia uh, as a result because that cortical uh, awareness is not being regulated. Those cortical neurons get detached or, or no, there, no, there are no synapses attached to them. And so they just start, uh, you know, firing randomly. And so paresthesia is uh, a kind of literally like a paranormal um, sense, a somatic sense. So uh, paresthesia is when people f feel things that uh, there's no physical uh, object performing, you know, uh, touching their skin uh, or, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Allodynia is when a normal sensation, like a touching of the skin, uh, is considered painful. Uh, so uh, normal sensation becomes painful. Uh, hyperpathia, when a painful sensation like a pinprick feels like, uh, you know, a massive needle or something, uh, when the it's amplified. And then hypoesthesia is a decrease in sensitivity uh, to uh, normal touch. So it just feels lighter or not as apparent. So these are, uh, this is kind of the clinical uh, signs of a, a thalamic lesion. Now some more of these pathways, uh, talking about the motor pathway, uh, volitional motor control from the motor cortex to the arm to control the arm, but we have uh, conscious input about from the cerebellum telling us about our proprioceptive uh, functions and how our intended actions are reflected by our actual actions. So our frontal cortex intends an action and sends that information down to our body and we, our body performs an action but then our cerebellum is getting proprioceptive information from all of these muscles and telling us how those muscles are actually oriented in space relative to our bodies and relative to the joints. And so that information that uh, we have to check that our movements are accurate. And so that information is going to the VL of the thalamus, ultimately uh, being outputted to the uh, motor cortex, to our uh, somatosensory and motor cortices through association fibers, so that we can c volitionally correct that information, volitionally correct our intended action. So if I intend to grab something, uh, I might, you know, miss it if I don't have proprioceptive information. And actually that's what happens uh, in a case of inebriation. Um, uh, an in individual is not able to, uh, you know, move uh, appropriately their their cortex they are activating motor output but their cerebellum which is highly vascularized is being inhibited by alcohol and it's not getting the proprioceptive uh, information about how the body is actually oriented so a uh, police officer performs uh, the test you know walk in a, on the line and touch your nose without looking and those are all uh, neurological tests of the cerebellum and the functioning of the cerebellum. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, uh, there you go. So, how can these regions of the cerebellum be damaged? Well, the cerebellum uh, receives blood supply primarily from the uh, posterior cerebral uh, artery of the circle of Willis. So, that posterior cerebral artery gives off the posterior choroidal artery. So here we have the posterior view of the brainstem. Remember like where we cut off the cerebellum to see the rhomboid fossa. That's what we're seeing here and we can see the um, posterior choroidal artery branching from the PCA running on top of the thalamus. Remember the thalamus is located on the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. So posterior choroidal is an artery branch supplying the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle as well as the, uh, the dorsal portions of the thalamus. Um, so what else do we have? We have uh, thalamogeniculate and thalamoperforating branches from the PCA as well, which supply the ventral uh, 
uh, side and the lateral side of the thalamus. So this is a lateral view. You can see the internal carotid artery here. You can see the basilar artery uh, giving off the PCA heading posteriorly. <clears throat> so um, those are the main arteries supplying the thalamus. Uh, so um, we also have listed the th thalamotuberal, which is a little bit more anterior. It's actually coming off the posterior communicating artery. Uh, but the lenticulostriates coming off the MCA are going to supply the lenticular nuclei as well as the internal capsule. So these lenticulostriate arteries, uh, if they get damaged, uh, or if there's an embolism or stroke or uh, you know a, a thrombus, whatever the case may be, uh, causing an ischemic event, then the internal capsule can be damaged, and that can um, kind of mimic a thalamic lesion. Uh, so, so be aware of that as well. Um, okay, yeah, I just said that. So anyway, that's all I have for the thalamus. Uh, the thalamus. I hope it was as thrilling for you as it was for me. Uh, see you next time.